And a big thank you for everyone who provided food and cooked in the kitchen and washed up, cleaned up and put away. A uh, big thank you for that because it was a really good meal this morning. And boy, I'm still full from it. I still can't move. But it was a real good time, good time of fellowship. And everything goes better, doesn't it, with food? Yeah. yeah. Definitely. <laughs> you mentioned food, everyone's there. You mentioned fasting, everybody disappeared. <laughs> like. But um, <clears throat> yeah, we're looking into, again, we've been going through this chapter of Luke, Luke 1. And starting there in verse 36, and I did find a Bible with slightly wider print, larger print. Uh, verse 1, verse 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin exposed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came to her and said, Hail you that are highly favoured, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said to her, Fear not, Mary, for you have found favour with God. And behold, you shall conceive in your womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give to him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary to the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit shall come upon you, and the power of the highest shall overshadow you. Therefore also the holy thing which shall be born of you shall be called the Son of God. And behold, your cousin Elizabeth shall also conceive a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaiden of the Lord be it to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Sorry, I just came out dizzy reading that passage for some reason. But anyway, you know, Luke writes to the most excellent Theophilus, Theophilus meaning lover of God, and he reveals that Jesus is going to be born in poverty. And in the Bible, poverty and justice are referred to over 3,000 times. And when we hear about the birth of Jesus, we always hear how he was born in a manger in Luke 2 verse 7. And a manger is basically a feeding trough that the barnyard animals would eat from. And Mary had to use this feeding trough because there was no room at the inn. The inn would have been, and maybe a little bit of a, of a unsavory, seedy place where poorer travelers would seek a place for the night. Those who had wealth would seek to shelter in private homes. But Mary and Joseph couldn't afford that luxury. And where they were going to go to spend the night was where the poor people would spend the night. But when they arrived at the inn, it was completely full. They had to find shelter somewhere else. They were forced to spend the night in the place where they kept the animals. And that's where Mary goes into labor. So she's there, she's the animals, the manger's all there, the straw is down, and she's about to give birth. I mean, poor Joseph must have been in quite a state, panicking. 
What do you do? But in there, the Son of God is born. Not in a five-star hotel. Not in the pristine palace or the castle. But where you keep the livestock at night. Even the name Jesus is associated with poverty. At the name, Je Je at the name Jesus reminds us of the sacrifice that Jesus had to make in 2 Corinthians 8 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that through though that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. That you that you through, through his poverty may be rich. The Apostle Paul said these words in the context of the Macedonian churches wanting to give a collection to the suffering Jewish Christian believers in Jerusalem. And Paul encourages the Corinthian church to give a gift, an act of grace to help them, in, to help the suffering Jewish believers. And in doing so, they will, they will be following the example of Jesus' sacrifice for them. The Corinthian church should give proportionately out of their abundance to meet the needs of, of other believers so that there may be enough for everybody. Paul the Apostle reveals that Jesus demonstrated God's grace by willingly becoming poor. Jesus was rich and secure in heaven with its streets of gold, with its walls of precious gemstones, where there was no disease and illness, no conflict outwardly or inwardly, where there's no filth or sickness, pain nor famine, a place of perfect harmony, a place of perfect beauty and purity, and yet Jesus voluntarily becomes, a poor, becomes poor almost like that of a beggar on the poverty scale. You know, he is reduced to extreme poverty. You know, there are different levels of poverty. And Jesus was on the bottom rung of the ladder. Jesus, who is the creator of all things, while living here, he possessed nothing that was not given to him by somebody else. Jesus, was totally self-giving, giving of himself, coming to earth to save us from sin. So we may enter into the riches of his glory. He becomes poor so that we may become rich. In Christ we are made rich. Heaven is our true spiritual home. Knowing the work of the Holy Spirit, Knowing the treasures of Scripture, it makes us rich before Almighty God. Jesus, he had to become poor, he had to become vulnerable, so we may become spiritually rich and one day enter physically into heaven, a physical place where we will lack no good thing. When Jesus was going to the cross. The only thing he possessed were the clothes, the robe he stood up in, a seamless garment that the soldiers gambled for in John 19. No doubt this had been given to him from a wealthy follower. While Jesus lived nearly every significant, sorry, while Jesus lived, when, 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 while Jesus lived, <laughs> nearly every significant event, he used something borrowed. He borrowed a boat to preach from. He stayed in people's homes. He borrowed a donkey to ride on. He borrowed a room to celebrate the Passover feast. He borrowed a cross on which to die on. And he borrowed a tomb to be buried in. Jesus gave up his claims to all things 
so that we might be given all things. Jesus, who made all things, Jesus, who owns all things, lays it all down so that people like us, who have nothing, could be made the heirs of all things. Because of salvation in Jesus Christ, we become his heirs. We have an inheritance in Christ Jesus. Romans 8 verse 17, And if children, heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs in Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may be also glorified with him. Jesus becomes poor, so we may become heirs. Most of us would be satisfied just to be merely being saved, rescued, not so that we don't go to hell. We would be satisfied with having a, a quiet little corner up in heaven to spend all of eternity free from suffering. Instead, God has made each person who trusts in the Lord Jesus for salvation an heir to the glories and the riches of God's kingdom. For us to become heirs is an unnecessary act of God. But he chooses to make us heirs out of his enormous love for us. God is the creator and we are the created. And he loves us so much that he sent his only begotten son to die for us so that whoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. And if we have that everlasting life, we have so much to look forward to in the glory. In this lifetime, yeah, we have our struggles and our difficulties and pains and aches and all those sort of things. But there is a place that we are heading that is free from all pain and all suffering. A place that we become fully alive in. A place where we will go, we can continually explore. We can continually <clears throat> worship God before his throne. Heaven is a living reality. And it is a gift that is given to us through Christ. In Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit, God has welcomed us fully and adopted us fully into his kingdom through Jesus Christ. And if we're in Christ's kingdom, then Jesus is king and we are living for him. And we know something of the glory inside of us. That joy, that peace, that presence of the Lord that is so, so rich and so tangible at times. And this is the greatest gift. That we have salvation in Christ and we should meditate upon it as Christ becomes, flat, takes on flesh is born of Mary so that he can identify with us at every step of our human existence. And yes, Romans 8 verse 17 is absolutely honest as it says, as we are identified with Jesus, we can expect persecution. <laughs> and it's going to increase. And we can expect suffering. Because we associate with Jesus. And those who suffer with Christ do so on their way to being glorified with him. When they are taken home to glory. And the more you try to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. The more you try to depend on his Holy Spirit. And follow in the footsteps of Christ. God the Father is glorified. He is magnified because you're being faithful and obedient. And as you're faithful and obedient, so you receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit. But at the same time, there are those who would seek to persecute. 
and intimidate and ridicule and, and, and cause suffering to those who are in Christ because we stand up for what the Bible teaches. And when you stand up for what the Bible teaches, you can end up alienated. You can end up isolated. You can end up feeling so frustrated because everyone else has a different world view than yourself as you are trying to walk in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as you identify with him, you know his riches, you get to know his strength, you get to know what the, some of the things that Christ went through, and these things that they kind of refine us. But one day, if we are faithful, and when we enter into the glory, we receive the rewards for what we have done, as we have sought to follow Christ. Jesus becomes Paul to rescue us, to save us from our sin. Jesus being born into poverty was all part of God the Father's great plan to save us. And wherever he places us, he asks us to be a witness for himself, to shine the light out into darkness. And the darkness cannot comprehend, it cannot put out the light of the Lord Jesus that shines through us as we walk in obedience, even if it means suffering for Christ. As his disciples, his wisdom and strength, in, in the things that are the things that seem so weak and insignificant, Christ being born a baby so vulnerable seems so insignificant, seems so weak. And yet it was God's power, God's strength being displayed. A baby God's son, poor and vulnerable, comes to reveal that Jehovah is salvation. And Jesus' name means Jehovah is salvation. And Jesus' name reveals his ministry to the world. As Jesus' name reveals what Jesus came to do, he comes to reveal the salvation that is in Jehovah. Matthew 1 verse 21 says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus did not come to set up a business, he didn't come to overthrow the Romans back in the day. He didn't come to make everybody happy and throw a big party. Jesus came to save us from the power of sin, from the power of death, and from the power of the devil, to restore a relationship back to God the Father that sin has robbed us from. And in Christ, that wall of sin, that barrier, it comes down. And we are forgiven. And as we are forgiven, so we know the purity and the holiness of Christ cleansing our soul, setting our spirit free, so that we may walk in the riches of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, he had to leave the riches of the glory behind to come to earth, to be born into poverty, to save us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus, the incarnate deity, was born into poverty so that he may identify with every single person on this planet. He knows wealth and riches. He knows suffering and pain. He knows poverty. And his heart cries out, Come unto me, and ye can be saved. You can be born again. You can have a new heart and new spirit if you believe on the Lord Jesus and accept him into your life as a personal saviour, as the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And if you believe in Christ, that's all you've got to do is just believe in him, confess your sin to him, and allow him to have control of your life and to come in. So as that happens, you step into God's kingdom. 
And as you believe and as you follow, so he equips you and he fills you with his spirit so you can keep following the Lord Jesus and be his disciple in a world that is in darkness and is becoming very anti-Christ in its approach these days with the secular humanism. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father except through Jesus Christ, who was born for us. Amen. Amen.